Coming up on this episode of One-on-One -on -one Sports. We finally get to dive into the Jimmy Butler trade. Look at the latest college football playoffs. Head to the ice for some NHL reactions. All that and so much more. And it all starts right now. episode of 101 Sports. I'm Matt Holzaffel. I'm Andrew Vandellis. We got an exciting show for you this week, but let's get it started with the quick hitters. The Baltimore Ravens have been using rookie quarterback Lamar Jackson as more of a wildcat running back player instead of a true dual threat quarterback. Matt, is it time the Ravens expanded the, expanded the playbook with him or even give him a start? Maybe. It depends. Because you look right now, they're four and five, and they're so close to having a lost season if they don't get some wins quick. I could see why they would maybe give him some play time if they get down the stretch, the season's over. Why not give him some rest? But for now, you got to go with Joe Flacco. And I know you want to say I about agree. this. Go for so, it. It's all you. No. Absolutely not. Unless Flacco gets hurt, which is the rumor going into the bye week. But John Harbaugh said he is very likely to be back at home against Cincinnati. Here's the thing. He probably, Jackson probably is the highest ceiling out of any rookie quarterback in this draft, but he's just not ready to start. To any Baltimore fan wanting Lamar Jackson to start, stop. No, the offense runs better, better through Flacco. The receivers work better through Flacco. Alex Collins gets more time. Lamar Jackson, the is, only great I have. Is that just because Flacco's been there longer? That's what, that just because Flacco knows the offense and he has a better repertoire with these receivers. It's just not, and he's better. not penalize Lamar Jackson for being new, can no, we? No, it's not. It's not, but here's the thing. I think where the Ravens are going wrong with using him is the trick play thing. When, when, you know, Jackson's lined up behind center, Flacco's on the wing, and teams are like, oh, I wonder what they're going to do. That's where I get tired of it. I would love to see him throwing a little bit more, and I truly think Jackson's time is going to come, just not yet. So why does it work for Taysom Hill and the Saints and not for the Ravens and Lamar Jackson? Then? I, I, I can't tell you. Maybe Jackson needs to be, I guess Taysom Hill gets to throw the ball at least a little mm -hmm. bit, and I think Jackson needs to be assimilated into that a little bit. I don't think Harbaugh trusts his arm yet, and that's why we're not seeing more of him throwing. That's why we're seeing more of him running. But I do think his time will come. I've said from the, get, the, the beginning, the move is to sit Flacco behind, I mean, sit uh, Jackson behind Flacco for at least a year. I will say, Flacco's closing in on 2,500 yards through nine games. He's not having a bad season no. by any stretch of the imagination. It is not solely his fault they're four and five. So you can't put the blame on him, and therefore you can't move on from him, especially not when he still has so much left in his career. I could talk for hours about this, I know but you could. <laughs> stay patient, Ravens fans, please. After holding out and declining offers from several NFL teams, Des Bryant signed a one-year deal with New Orleans Saints. Just two days later, De Bryant tore his Achilles on the last play of practice. And it was just the last we've seen of Des Bryant, and will he ever be able to regain that star power he once had in Dallas? He'll be back. He's still got the ability to be a productive receiver. Here's the thing with Des. You have to keep in mind that he went from gunslinging Romo to a more mobile quarterback like Dak. That's why we didn't see a whole lot of him in his last season at Dallas. If he re-signs with the Saints, which I think he does, and should do, he doesn't need to be the number one, number two, or even number three receiver. Here's all the Saints or any team need for that matter. They need from him a couple of first down conversions, maybe like eight or nine yards at most, and they just need him at the goal line to have a presence. He's not gonna be a streak route, he's not gonna be in the slot as much. You just need him to be efficient. He doesn't need to go a thousand yards. It almost receiving. feels like he'd be better off being a mentor for Michael Thomas, who will be a great receiver, and already is a who great is. receiver. Yeah. And Des is only 30, he's not like he's in the, the peak of it, he's past no. the peak, for sure. He's yeah. not in the final stage of his career yet. Last year with Dallas, he had 69 catches, almost 900 yards, six touchdowns. He's not going to be a 1,000 yard receiver a bad year. And that was a bad yeah. year for, De for Des by his standards before. Imagine going from Dak to Drew Brees. I don't think there's any quarterback, if, I, if I'm a receiver, there's no quarterback I want throwing the ball to me other than Drew Brees, or more than Drew Brees, I should say. And he'll utilize him no matter what in any role, and it'll be amazing either way. Yeah. Zion Williamson has become a household name despite having played two games in college so far. Warriors coach Steve Kerr is just one of the big names who has taken notice, saying that he thought LeBron James was a one-shot deal, but apparently the next guy's coming, referring to Williamson. Matt, is this praise for someone so young very fair? 
I think it might be overhyped, but you got to look at this. He's been getting this praise. He's been compared to LeBron James and Julius Randle most prominently since high school. And he was known as that viral dunk video guy, and now he's turning to so much more. He's shooting threes. He's blocking. He had six blocks against Army. He's averaging a double-double. And so when he had the dunks and he had the athleticism and also the physicality that LeBron had, he's adding shooting to that. There's no wonder why he's being compared to LeBron. Here's the thing. First off, Kerr qu quickly changed the subject, didn't name Zion directly. We all know he just wanted to avoid a fine, Absolutely. but we all know that's who he was talking about. Second, everyone makes comments like this. It's fair for Kerr to go out on a limb and say this about a player. And he can ball. Have you seen the kid oh, play? he can ball. He I is love a it. human cheat code at college basketball. He's elevated Duke. I know I said that last week as well. And he's getting the praise, the praise he deserves from one of the NBA's greatest coaches. He's got comparisons to Vince Carter. John Wall said he was Vince Carter. Charlotte Observer said he could be the best high school dunker of all time. He's going to get the comparisons. He's, he's transcended just that in. like so much and he's elevating Duke. Duke is already a favorite to win the national championship. Already favored to be the number one in the country. The deserved number one team in the country. Zion is the forerunner for that team. We love Zion. Yeah, totally. On Sunday, Louisville announced that they had dismissed head coach Bobby Petrino after a 2-8 and eight start to the season. This has been a quick fall from last year's success with Lamar Jackson. Andrew, should they have let Bobby Petrino finish this season? No, absolutely not. And I know you agree. Once Lamar Jackson left, our, our beloved Lamar Jackson, from the first question, he lost all motivation to win. He produced a 41-9 record through his first four years at Louisville from 03 to 06. But then returning to Louisville in 2014, his record went 36 to 26. That's sad. Louisville Athletic Director Vince Tira mentioned that energy and an ability to relate to kids was a, a thing they're searching for in the next coach. Maybe that's the reason they fired Petrino. I'm glad you saw the numbers because I'll, I'll just take my time to tell you a story. Go ahead, right? please. So he was with Louisville. In, two, or in 2003, he was one year as the Auburn OC. He took the Louisville head coaching job, also interviewed for the Auburn head coaching job while being hired for Louisville, that makes no sense. No. He signed a 10-year extension with the Cardinals in 2006, saying, I'm not going anywhere. He told the world that. Next year, he left for the Atlanta Falcons. And to, remember 2007, with the Falcons at 3-8 and eight and without Michael Vick due to injury, he says, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I promise I'm not leaving. Half of the season, he's gone. Mm -mm. So he has a consistent reputation for not living up to expectations, not sticking with a team and letting the fans down. Of course they should have He could never fire up his players, and it started to show what a Lacadega school staff he had under him at Louisville as well. And as you mentioned, it did not translate well over to the pros. I think it's great because Louisville can blow it all up now and try to rebuild. It's clear that he is having trouble controlling a locker room. That was with the Falcons. He quit with a 78-word letter in the locker room. He just, he's not having a good coaching career. He needs a restart somewhere. For me, good riddance. Absolutely. That's all the time we have for the quick hitters. When we come back, I'll be discussing the biggest trade from this weekend. At long last, the Jimmy Butler drama in Minnesota has finally come to an end. Denver will send Butler to the city of brotherly love in exchange for Robert Covington, Dario Saric, Jerry Bayless, and a 2022 second round pick. I'm here with Brad Clear, and we'll burn to break down the deal. So guys, now that Butler's on the 76ers, are they the favorite to win the East, Brad? Uh, no. I think they're a much better team than they were on Friday. I think before this trade, they were the fourth best team in the East behind Milwaukee, Boston, and Toronto. I still think Toronto and Boston, even though Boston has not played to that level yet, are still above them. I think they have surpassed Milwaukee with this deal. Again, it remains to be seen yeah. if they play, but I will say Toronto is the best team in the East, in my opinion, and just based off the sheer talent, I'd say Boston's ahead of them as well. I agree. I trust Jason Tatum and Brad Stevens in a seven-game series against the 76ers. They lost 4-1 last year, and that was without their two best players, Kyrie and Gordon Hayward. They, it didn't fix their two biggest problems, which is spreading the floor and their depth. I, I disagree. Their number one issue was getting a guy who could score at will on the perimeter. They needed a guy who could score in the clutch, a guy you could throw the ball to at the end of the game to get you a shot. They did not have that before. Now they have one of the Let's look at Minnesota. We know they sent Butler, who had really been embattled with the team all season. What is next for them now? They've added Covington, Sarich, Bayless, and that pick. Will? I mean, they got a decent deal out of it. Sarich and Covington are two 11 and 5 guys. They're good role players, Great. but I still think they should have taken one of the other two trades that they were offered, either Josh Richardson from the Heat or the four first rounders from Houston. That gives you so much, so many picks for the future, not only to invest, mm. but he, even if they wanted to trade him, he, I, I think they should have taken one of those two well, deals. Well, the Josh Richardson one went away when Tom Thibodeau was being delusional. The Houston one, we don't know what the protections were on those picks. Getting back to what they got, though, Bob Covington is one of the 10 best defenders in the NBA. 
Dario Saric is a glue guy who can fit on any team in the league. But this team is currently constructed, is stuck in that sort of going nowhere, like 10 seed range. There's no way they can get better or make the playoffs over the nine teams in front of them. And their talent level is just very mediocre, I would say. I, right I now. agree. Towns is not that guy. He was he was the number one pick, but he's I, still I an st all-star caliber player. He, I, I don't think he could deliver at the end of the day. Along with Wiggins, Wiggins is not living up to his potential. No, they, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs this no. year. If they do, it would be the AT, and then they would get spanked I, I see, in the first I round. I see no chance that that happens. Again, look, look at this team. Jeff Teague, Derek Rose, Andrew Wiggins, Bob Covington, Sarge, Gibson, Towns. That's not a playoff it's team, special. especially in the West. Yeah. yeah, that big three didn't pan out. They tried it. Obviously fell apart. So, obviously, news was coming. Who won the trade? Who got the better deal? Brad? Uh, it's got to be the Sixers. I mean, you got one of the 15 best players in the league. You didn't give up a first-round pick. Hey, in a vacuum, take away all the circumstances. You turn Bob Covington, Dario Sarge, a second round pick and Jared Bayless's washed headband into Jimmy Butler every single time. And for the Timberwolves, they very badly judged the situation and got less than they should have for Butler. I agree. The Sixers did win this trade. The Timberwolves, obviously, like I said, didn't really get as much as they could have. Um, I think Embiid is an MVP candidate this year, Absolutely. the way he's playing early on. Jimmy Butler, like you said, is one of the 15 best players in the NBA. Ben mm. Simmons, I'd like to see him develop a little more this year than, than he has been. I kind of expected more from him this year. Well, but it's still as, early. as time goes on, I do think that the three will mesh together. Hopefully, mm -hmm. there's no chemistry issues. And I'll say this to that how many teams in the league can say they have three of the top 25 players in the league? Not many. The Sixers can now. Absolutely. Philly looking good. Jimmy Butler is gone from Minnesota. We're gone for this block. When we come back, Drew Drenchy and Everett Piercy will be here to break down some college football playoff predictions. buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. The next 30 seconds can save you a lot of money. Just do your laundry in cold and stick to full loads. Auto-sleep your computers. Plug your gadgets in a power strip and switch it off when you're done. Head it out, turn back your thermostat by 10 degrees. And drive sensibly. The more energy you save, the more money you save. Find other great tips at energysaver.gov. College football playoffs slowly nears, and there's not been much of a change at the top of the standings. With that being said, I'm joined by Evan Piercy and Drew Gentry to discuss the matchups that we might be seeing come playoff time. So, Evan, which team that is currently on the outside looking in has the best chance of cracking the top four? So I think it's Georgia. They have the SEC East locked up. They're going to be in the championship game. They're going to be playing Alabama. The only, like They have to beat Alabama. It's simple. Beat Alabama, you're in the playoffs. You just have to beat Bama. And this is a team that can do it. Jake Fromm's looked a lot better. They were so they close to last they year. They were close. They, they did better. last year. And then, you know, they were close last year in the national championship game. Obviously, Alabama had the amazing comeback. But it was more poor defense on Georgia. So hopefully Georgia's learned their lesson to play defense, to do cover mm -hmm. two, to have the safety over the top with the corner, mm -hmm. not allow All the right. deep pass, and get Bama, it. Bama, no. Just yes. no. 
No, can. Georgia's not going to be They Bama. could. There's They're an opportunity. Not. There's absolutely no chance Georgia beats Bama. I'm going with West Virginia. Because, yes, they're that nine overall right now. They're ranked nine, but they play Oklahoma. That's the six. Notre Dame's going to collapse. They always choke. Michigan. I don't know. Will, Notre Dame, is Notre Dame always this year. chokes. Notre Dame always chokes. Shots fired. Michigan will win and be the top three. Pac-12 is weak, so uh, Washington yeah. State's out of the question. Georgia's definitely losing to Bama. Nobody's beating Bama. Bama's but winning they, the national okay. championship. And then you cannot let – LSU. LSU's it, not LSU. in. They have two losses. Yeah, exactly. But here's so my thing about, here's my thing about West Virginia. In. If Notre Dame was going to collapse, it was going to collapse at Virginia Tech. Well, now that we're talking yeah. about fantasy matchups in the playoffs, Drew, what matchup do you want to see most in the playoffs? West Virginia, Bama. First round, Tua versus Will Greer. My top two Heisman. Mm. Obviously, I've been biased all season. I'm always saying Will Greer, but Tua's going to be, if that matchup happens, well, that's heaven. Your top two candidates. That's, that's not like going to be close. Jump. It's going to be a blowout. It's going to be. Bama's going to beat West Virginia It's going to be Ben Jones versus Reggie Bush kind of national oh my God. championship. No, it's not. Top two Absolutely Heisman not. candidates. No. Top All right. two. All right. All right. You got to be top two. All right, All right, Evan. You're so adamant All about right. it. Who's, what's your fantasy matchup? My matchup is I want to see the Clemson defense shut down the Alabama offense because they can. Their <laughs> defensive line is incredible. You have Lawrence in there. They can get four. They their front four can put pressure on the quarterback like no one else. They can drop seven back in coverage, give Tua no opportunity to throw the ball. If he tries to run, their defense can get there because they can have a, a spy in there as a as a middle linebacker. I really like that matchup too, though. Like that, I, do, I, do, I think incredible. that's gonna happen. I think, I think that's gonna, gonna happen. I think too. that's gonna happen. That's why I said, what is the one I'm looking forward to that I could see happening? West Virginia and Bama, because those two candidates, like I said, those are the top two quarterbacks in the nation right now. Wait. Top two quarterbacks in the nation. What is a better way to show out on the national playoff but scale one versus four? It doesn't. Bama's going to run away that's with it. Uh, the story does kind of sell itself. You get, you Bama's gonna, top two the, Heisman. That I don't know. Top, that the top Grier, defense baby. versus the top <laughs> offense. Defense wins championships. This is Clemson. This is a good team. Trevor Lawrence, a quarterback, is a gunslinger. This guy has gotten better with every oh, game. I love Clemson Trevor. is hitting I their stride. Team. They are blowing teams out. Granted, the ACC is weak, but they can beat Bama. All right, well, that's all the time we have for this sprint edition of a college football playoff prediction. When we come back, Matt will be hitting the ice for some NHL. The NHL season is just starting to heat up as teams are beginning to take form. There are many NHL teams that started the season off hot, and I'm here with Emmanuel Tope and Louis Smoller to discuss which teams will stay hot and which teams are going to cool down as the season goes on. So guys, our first team, the Minnesota Wild, 11-4-2, second in the Central Division in the West. Emmanuel, are they going to stay hot or are they cool off? Oh, I got them staying hot. I love this team. I was hyped on them last year, but of course they had a bunch of injuries that basically derailed their momentum. But this year, I'm hyped on this team. I was hyped on them in the beginning, and I'm hyped on them now. They just finished a successful seven-game road trip in which they were 5-2, and two, and the seven games is their longest road trip in their, in their franchise history. And somehow they still managed to score 10 points out of the 14. I mean, this is a successful team. I really believe in them this year, and I think they can do it. Yeah, without a doubt, that away, that home, that away trip, the road trip, was really, really important to their season. But they're a streaky team, and they've always been a streaky team. I have a friend back at home who's a huge Wild fan, and he always tells me at least once a, once a year, a month a year, they lose a lot, and they're going to do that because they cannot keep with this young league. The NHL is a very young league, and it's quickening up, and they're an old team. They have Zach Parise, Miko Koivu, Ryan Suter, and well, but Devin But Zach Dumas. Parise, who was playing phenomenal, like, don't sleep on your elders now. Come oh, on, no, I respect no, your elders. I'm not sleeping. I'm saying they're going to die out. Because they're older, they're not going to have enough gas in the tank. And I, I mean, <laughs> literally. I mean, but you also have Michael Grenlin, who's playing like a star this year. I, I've, we've seen him really grow into this role. You know, he has 10 goals, 8 assists. His 10 goals are 8th in the NHL. He has three game-winning goals. I mean, if you see how this man plays, I think he can really lead this team. And he can really take these old guys, as you say, and really carry them over that mountain. Not only can... Not only are they too old to keep up with the younger guys? But their division is way too strong. With Winnipeg, Nashville, Dallas is in their division as well, Colorado, and so on and so forth. They have a strong division, one of the strongest in the league. And I don't think they're going to be able to keep oh. up with the youth of Nashville, Winnipeg. I agree that they have a tough division, but I'm looking at their record. They just finished their they just finished a seven game road trip. So there's seven out of their next nine games are at home. We talk about old. We talk about you know veterans. Them playing at home, they will now have time to rest. They will now have time to recuperate. I see this month right here being one of their best months. Minnesota, 
like you said, they have bad months, but also good months. We'll keep them afloat. Let's go up north, a little bit north, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hot or cold, Luis? Oh, I'm going to have to stay hot. They just acquired Jonathan Tavares in the offseason, and he's one of the best centers in the league, if not the best center in the league. And not only did they acquire him, they didn't lose too many players at all, if any at all. They still have a great center depth with Jonathan Tavares, Austin Matthews, and William Nylander on the wings. Ooh, the William he, Nylander situation, though. That's the question, though. You talk about William Nylander, but, you know, there's a, there's a contract dispute going on right now with them. I have them staying hot as well. But I really think one thing that we're going to have to think about is how, the William, how this situation will affect the team going forward. You know, Nylander's been someone that a lot of people on the team really like, but with him, you know, having issues, I'm, you know, I wonder how that will affect the team chemistry. They still have the depth without Nylander, with Kaspari Kapan, who can snipe as well. Oh, I agree. Mitch Marner. They have Morgan Riley on the defense. And then Frederick Anderson in the goal uh, in net to kind of top oh, it off. I agree with the depth, but it's the chemistry that I'm worried about. I agree with the depth. They have talent. This is one of the most talented teams in the NHL. Well, losing one player won't destroy your chemistry. It won't destroy your room. chemistry, but when we're talking about the long run, I'm just, I'm just curious on how it would affect this team. Because it's not like they're just losing him. They're, this is kind of, I won't say this will turn into a Le'Veon Bell situation, but this is kind of big, this is a really ugly situation right now. And it's not looking like it's going to clear up until either they trade him or they just let him go. Well, the Steelers aren't doing too bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not doing too bad. Always a bad situation. <laughs> Very quickly, Dallas Stars, last team, Manuel Hottercold. Oh, I have, them, I have them going cold. I really like the Stars, but just they have just been beat up by injuries as well as their schedule. They have had a rough schedule. Yeah, not only are they beat up by injuries, but in previous years they've struggled away a lot. And it shows here when they have a 3-4-1 record away already. And they just lost last night to the uh, Vancouver Canucks. And like I said, they always had trouble away. And you play half your games away. When you play half your games away and you struggle, you're not going to have a good record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, still early in the season, but those three teams definitely looking to keep it going as you go forward. It's all from the ice, but I'm going to throw it long to Andrew who's going to come back with some NFL. I've got a job to do today. I've got a job to do today. Your donations to Goodwill fund job training programs right in your community. Feels good to start fresh, right? Sure does. And like that, you're a job creator. You sure you don't want some? It's chamomile. Listen, you are extremely terrifying. Just the scariest undead subhuman thing on TV, and I really mean that. <laughs> but I am worried that you could give my kids nightmares if they see you, so I'm gonna have to block you. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, and, and tell the zombies they're, they're blocked too. Get caught buzz driving, and you could do some hard time. Craig, knock it off. Sorry, Mom. It could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. And that could set you back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There were thousands of children. You didn't give up on sex. 
Don't give up on birth control either. There are more methods than you think. Find yours at bedsider.org. questions that are going on in the league. So Josh, what's wrong with the Eagles, you know, after a loss to the Cowboys? What's going on? I mean, if, listen, there's no motivation going on there. I mean, listen, you win the Super Bowl with Doug Peterson. He's a great coach and all that. There's just no creative play calling going on. They're four and five. There's no motivation on their O-line. I mean, there's no, no running game. I mean, Wentz is not playing up. I mean, Wentz is like one of the lowest rate running quarterbacks in the league right now. I mean, Wentz isn't playing, playing terribly, He's not though. playing terribly, but he's not winning games. I mean, the Eagles have not lost any key players. In fact, they just added a Golden Tate. You'd think they'd still be in the Super Bowl contention, but they're four and five. I'd argue that their season's done. They've got a very rough schedule coming up, and arguably the Redskins could run away with that division. The Eagles have no motivation to win. I mean, Lane Johnson said him himself that they don't want to have that Patriot winning mentality in the offseason. And I think they're going to be content with that one Super Bowl win, and Eagles fans are just going to be happy with that. Well, we'll move on now to the Cleveland Browns. Who would be the best person for the head coaching job now that yeah. Hugh Jackson's gone? I mean, I, I think Hugh Jackson might have been on to something there. I mean, I still think he should have been fired last season. But I think Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma would be a good fit for them just because I think he should be proven in the NFL. I think him and Baker Mayfield had a great partnership. Great offensive mindset, and the Browns need that offensive player. I mean, Greg Williams is a good defensive coach. Yeah, I was I mean, going to say, what do you think about Greg Williams? Minus, you know, the you know bounty gate thing. That's that's yeah. years in the past. But the Browns are playing great defense. I say relegate Greg Williams to a defensive coach, put Lincoln Riley in, get that offense going, and the Browns can be a real force to be reckoned with. Finally, uh, the Steelers. Le'Veon Bell won't be reporting. Mm. He'll be out for the rest of the season and become a free agent. How does this impact the Steelers' chance to make a deep playoff run? I don't think it impacts it in the slightest. I mean, they're doing fine with James Conner, 10 touchdowns already on the season, already surpassed at the Le'Veon Bell's highest career mark in the season. So the fact that Le'Veon Bell's gone, like absolutely not coming back, you don't have to worry about him, will they, won't they, um, I think this is actually going to help them a bit. I still don't think they're a Super Bowl team. I think there's still a lot of drama in there. And yes, Le'Veon Bell not coming back is beneficial, but there's still a lot of questions left about their defense, but this could help them make a playoff run. Now, quick, kind of quick question personally. Mm -hmm. Would you rather have Le'Veon Bell on the Steelers or James Conner? I mean, Le'Veon Bell's got more, you know, mileage behind him. He's got more proof that he can, you know, be a star running back. But James Conner's the hot hand right now. I'd say stick with Connor, let him continue carrying the rock, and see where he goes. Not enough film on him for people to kind of study him. And but it doesn't him affect their their ability to make it, you know, to the yeah. AFC Divisional, AFC Championship, win I the still, division. I think they could win their division. They're playing very well right now. Um, ben Roethlisberger's having a good time. Antonio Brown, Juju Smith are both playing great. I mean, James Connor is carrying the load for them. So yes, I do think that. Well, no, I don't think that Le'Veon Bell being out hurts them in the slightest. Gotcha. Well, that's all the time we have for The Gridiron. Up next, Matt and I will be discussing the unluckiest sports deals in history. Stay tuned. Trades are commonplace in the world of sports, but sometimes they can leave us scratching our heads or full of regret. So, Matt, I ask you, what is the most unlucky sports deal ever? It's got to be Babe Ruth. I mean... In 1920, the Red Sox sold, essentially sold Babe Ruth to the Yankees for $100,000. Let me, let me rephrase that. Red Sox owner Harry Frazee sold the greatest baseball player in the history of the sport to their rival team for $100,000. After that, he went on to lead the Yankees to four World Series titles. Now, what does that translate now to nowadays, like money-wise? It's got to be a it's little not, bit. It's not worth it, though. Not it's not for Babe Ruth. It's Babe Ruth. But I'm going to tell you a sad tale about John Elway. The Baltimore Col Colts took a young whippersnapper in the first pick of the 1983 draft okay. who didn't even want to play for them. Rather than play, pay him a lot of money, they traded him away to the Denver Broncos because John Elway said, forget you guys, I'll go and play baseball. But one year later, the Colts would move out of Baltimore in 1984 on a snowy night, relocate to Indianapolis, and Elway would become like a two-time Super Bowl champion, MVP Super Bowl 30, to nine-time Pro Bowler, but unlucky for the Colts. So you got you lose your team and your number one pick. More for the you, city you of Baltimore. Or you give your opponent the greatest dynasty in the history of the sport. Those you are some know, bad trades. I don't even know. 
That's all the time we have for this episode of One-on-One -on -one Sports. A huge thank you goes to all our producers, crew, talent, and you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, be sure to check out our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, all at One-on-One -on -one Sports. That's all from us here in the studio. So until next time, whose side are you on?